Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gary Gillis. And a, a typical day at the office for me um, might involve jumping a lizard off of a miniature diving board. It might involve measuring how fast a salamander can swim. Sometimes it's even involved training a goat to gallop on a treadmill, which my kids find hilarious, but is not nearly as fun as you might think. I don't know if you've ever tried to get a goat to do something that it doesn't want to do, but it's hard to get it on a treadmill. The reason I get to do these things is because I'm interested in the biology of animal locomotion. I ask questions about how different animals move and how they use their nervous and muscular systems to generate those kinds of movements. Now, as we all know, the theme of today's session is jump, and so I figured I'd spend some time talking to you about that particular form of locomotion. That works well for me because my students and I have been studying an aspect of jumping that's received a lot less attention than the powerful propulsive movements that we use to accelerate our bodies into the air. Instead, we've been studying an inevitable consequence of being accelerated into the air, namely coming back into contact with the ground or landing. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about landing. If we take a broad view of landing as any time our feet come back into contact with the ground after having been up in the air for a while, then we actually land with every single step we take, right? And so that makes it a very common locomotor phenomenon, and that was one of the reasons we got interested in it. In addition, unlike the propulsive movements that these big leg muscles use to push us up into the air when we accelerate our bodies, during landing, we have to use muscles to decelerate our bodies. We have to remove or dissipate energy from the system, and we know a lot less about how muscles are used in these dissipating roles. And finally, one of the coolest things for me about landing is that there's a sense of prediction or anticipation that has to be involved if you want to land well, right? You've got to know something about when and how hard you're going to land, and so we're excited about studying the sensory cues that people or animals can use to make predictions about the, the nature of their upcoming impact. Now, it doesn't turn out that we study naked men running in our laboratory. They're much, much too hard to work with. <laughs> so instead, we study these guys. We study uh, cane toads. And this is a cane toad that's just come in for landing. You can see that it's on its, its uh, front limbs there. They use their arms to decelerate their bodies exclusively. I want you to imagine falling forward into a push-up and trying to prevent your face from hitting the ground. That's what these guys do with every single landing. And I'd like to use a couple of videos to uh, rationalize my choice of this particular frog species. Uh, and I'm going to start by showing you a video of a different frog species, jumping and landing, because it makes a nice, a nice counterpoint to the toad. So hopefully you can see on one side of the slide here, this is a grass frog, a typical kind of frog you'd find in your backyard, and uh, face plant, belly flop. This guy will reliably belly flop on every single landing. And while we can learn a lot from, from failure, we chose to use a different model uh, to study coordinated landing. And our model looks a little more like this. You get excited. This is poetry in motion right here. Watch, watch this landing. Boom. Sticks. It just holds. It's like a gymnast, right? Sticking the landing consistently. That's the cane toad. That's why we're excited to use these guys as a model for studying coordinated landing. And it doesn't hurt that unlike most frogs, uh, cane toads are not very slimy, so it's easier to convince my students to work on them with me. <laughs> so the, the real fundamental question that's been driving our lab is, is a, really a simple one. It's, it's why is it that toads are so good at landing? Why is it when they come in for impact, they're ready to go immediately for the next hop, whereas these guys come in for impact and they belly flop pretty regularly? And the way we started to think about this was in the context of human coordinated landing, where we actually already sort of understood a few of the basic principles. So let's talk a little bit about how humans coordinate landing. One of the first things that humans do, or one of the first things I'm going to tell you about that humans do when they jump into the air, is they are very dynamic with their arms and their legs, and they position their arms and legs so as to be balanced at impact, right? If you look at this guy's posture and the movements of his arms and legs, he's going to make sure that when he lands, the arms and legs are positioned uh, to balance at impact. In addition, if we were able to, to get into this guy's leg muscles in midair, 
what you would see is that he's tensing them. He's, he's anticipating impact by already contracting the muscles that are going to be important in decelerating his body before he hits the ground. And it's more than just that. The tension that he's using in those leg muscles is going to be tuned to the expected magnitude of the impact. And what I mean by that is, imagine jumping off of a roof. You would tense your leg muscles in a very different way than if you were just stepping off of the stage or off of the final step on a staircase, right? So humans tune this anticipatory tension in their legs for landing to the expected time and magnitude uh, of the impact. And finally, in order to do that, we seamlessly integrate sensory information. We have visual streams of information coming in. We have the information from our legs, which propelled us into the air in the first place. And we have these sensors in, inside of our heads that get screwed up when we get dizzy that measure linear and angular ex accelerations. And humans can use all that information really well to coordinate landing. So going back to what makes toads so good at landing, we thought, well, let's see if in some ways toads land, land like humans. Do they execute or achieve these particular tasks during landing? So let's walk through that. First question was, do these animals appropriately position their arms and legs so as to be balanced at the point of impact? And if we look at the very first pair of slides, right, here's the wipeout, here's the gymnast. The very first pair of slides, both of those animals look ready. They're both got their arms out, they're bracing for impact, so that's good. The problem with this frog, it turns out, is it's left its legs splayed out behind it. The toad, you'll notice, has rapidly pulled its legs in close to its body. And the reason that's going to turn out to be important is that in doing so, it's moved its center of mass. If you think of the mass distribution of the toad as being localized at a point, by moving its hind legs in toward the body, it's moved its center of mass forward. And it's moved it forward in such a way so as to align better with the ground reaction force. And that's what you need to do to achieve balance. That's why they can achieve that handstand. So the first point is, or the first answer is, yes, toads do get their arms and their legs in an appropriate position for balancing at impact. The second question was about anticipation in a general sense. Are they firing muscles that are going to be important in decelerating their bodies in midair before they hit the ground? Are they ready for impact? We can get at that by using a technique known as electromyography, where we can record in a living, jumping animal activity in muscles that signals what the nervous system is telling those muscles to do. And this beautiful picture, which is uh, an illustration drawn by one of my students, highlights a number of the muscles that we've already studied. And they're the sorts of muscles that you can imagine you would use if you were bench pressing or doing a push-up, right? The, the version of the toad's pecs, the triceps, the deltoids, uh, some of the forearm muscles as well. So let's look at some of the EMG data that we've got from these animals so that we can ask this question about tensing muscles before impact. Each of these lines of squiggly data here represents a channel recording from a muscle in an animal's arms. We've got some muscles that act at the elbow here and some at the shoulder. The squiggly black lines here represent when the nervous system is telling the muscle to start contracting and generate force. We're taking a video simultaneously while we're re recording these data. So we know that the animal's beginning its hop here and it's actually landing here. And remember, the question is, are they anticipating impact in the sense that they're recruiting muscles before they hit the ground? And the answer is yes. In all four of these cases, the nervous si system is telling the animal to tense the muscles before impact. So yes, these animals are anticipating landing. But remember, humans did more than that. They were actually very precise about their anticipation. I gave the analogy of jumping off the roof for stepping off of the stage. Humans tune muscle activity to the appropriate or expected magnitude of the impact. And we wanted to know if toads can do that too. And the way we framed that question was by asking, because if you put a toad on the ground, it'll hop different distances, do they prepare for landing differently depending on how far they hop? Because a long hop is going to lead to some pretty high forces at impact, so you might expect them to tense muscles more in anticipation of a hard impact than for a short impact. And the data tell the story, oh, excuse me, the data tell the story right here. What I've got here is a simple plot of a frog's hop distance versus this intensity of tension 
in the triceps muscle uh, prior to impact. And what you can see is that, sure enough, long hops out here around 40 to 50 centimeters lead to very high levels of tension in the triceps before impact. Short hops lead to much less tension. So yes, not only are they anticipating impact, the time of impact, they're tuning the tension in their muscles appropriately for the magnitude of that impact. So I hope I've been able to convince you as a starting point that toads make an interesting model system for studying coordinated landing and that in many ways they act like humans do in terms of the way they prepare uh, for impact. Because now we can start to ask some questions that in, in my opinion are actually even more interesting than the ones that I've already talked about. And the one that I'll, I'll mention is, is one that I alluded to earlier which is how do they make these predictions about when and how hard they're going to land. What are the sensory streams of information that they're using in order to do that? And I'll go back to these three possibilities that I mentioned earlier. One is that they might be using vision, right? If you can see how far the ground is from you, if you can see how fast the ground is approaching you, you have a sense of when you're going to hit it and, and how hard that hit is going to be. So vision presumably could be an important player in making these kinds of predictions. Proprioception is, let me, let me just say that as, as propulsive structures, your legs have sensors in them themselves, right? You can shut your eyes and jump up into the air and have some sense of, of how far you're going to jump and when you're going to land just based on how hard you pushed off the ground. How rapidly did your legs accelerate? Those sensors are part of what's known as your proprioceptive system and that seems to be an important system to investigate as well. And then finally, this vestibular system, which is in your inner ears, that's the part that gets messed up when you get dizzy, that's a sensor of accelerations, linear and angular accelerations. And as a jumper, if you know at what angle you take off and at what acceleration and over what duration you, you accelerated, you know exactly when you're going to land and how hard. It's a ballistic motion. It's very simple. So in the lab, we've been doing experiments to try to tease out the roles of these particular sensory systems in allowing toads to land in a coordinated way. And the one I'll talk about here is vision. And the way I'm going to talk about it is to not talk about it at all. I'm going to show you a video. This is a toad. This is a blind toad. This toad cannot see anything. I want you to look at what it's going to do as it comes in for landing gets its arms stretched out perfectly, and it's going to stick the landing beautifully. It's a little fat, so its belly hits the ground, but we'll, we'll, give it, we'll give it that. Vision is absolutely unnecessary for these guys to coordinate landing, and it doesn't matter how far they hop. So that means it must be something in their legs that's telling them what's up, or something inside this vestibular system in their inner ears. And Recent work that we've done in the lab suggests that it may not be the legs. You can remove sensory feedback from the legs during these animals' jumps and they still get their arms out in front of them. So we're really excited to investigate this inner ear story of the vestibular system, which we think is probably the key player in making predictions about coordinated landing. I want to wrap up with uh, work we did this summer with students, which was really fun. This is actually uh, basically a tadpole jumping. This is a tadpole that's just been taken out of the water. It has never seen the ground before in its life. Now, one response to this video I already heard over here. Oh, looks awful, right? These guys eat it. Watch this. I mean, this is impressive. Uh, and then, oh, that's not good. But if you view it through a slightly different lens, watch what it does first thing with its arms, if you can see it. The very first thing it does is gets it its arms out in front of itself. So in an animal that's completely aquatic, not even metamorphosed into a frog, it's never jumped before in its life, the elemental features of coordinated landing are already present, which we think is really, really interesting. And so we're excited to, to explore this sort of development of the neural control of landing in these animals. So I hope I've been able to convince you that, uh, that landing is not simply in an in inevitable consequence of jumping into the air. It's actually pretty interesting in and of itself, right? It's, it's actually cooler than taking off in many ways. If you were to ask a gymnast or a figure skater, they would say taking off is the easy part. It's actually the landing that's difficult. And so I would invite or encourage all of you to try and draw whatever 
metaphorical connections you can to the message I'm about to, to give you. And we've heard some talks today already about landing that I think provide a framework or a landscape for these kinds of metaphorical um, connections. But my, my main point, I think, is that if you're going to jump, you should have a plan for landing before you actually hit the ground, right? That's what the toads would say. That's what I say. And that's all I've got to say. So thank you. <laughs>